Hello, Luindi. Hello, hello, Luindi, are you there? Can you hear me? Just indicate on the comment box at the right hand corner of your screen. Just let me know you can hear me. Luindi, are you there? You are welcome, Luindi. This is Life Changes Show. We meet here each Saturday night to get to know God and ourselves. If you are here, it's not by accident. God wants you to be here. He planned you to be here at this time. You could have been somewhere else, but God wants you to be here. And this is Life Changes Show. It's a place where you find meaning and purpose for your life. Blessings. Hallelujah. Thanks for watching. Thanks for coming. God bless you all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to pray for you. Father, I thank you for your children who are here connected in your presence. Lord, I thank you for their lives. And I glorify your holy name because I know you have changed their lives. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. It is well. So the topic of today is a follow-up of the last week's uh, issues that we discussed. I received a lot of comments and questions regarding the last uh, week's uh, session because I talked more last time about Christianity not being a religion. And uh, I've received a lot of questions and comments concerning that. And so I decided that today I'm going to talk more about Christianity and religion. Christianity is not a religion. So, what then is Christianity and what then is religion? Blessings. I'm sure you're all excited to know this difference because most often we get things mixed up. We said, oh, you're a religious person. Oh, you, that's your religion. Uh, you know, people always use it interchangeably religion and Christianity. But I'm here to tell you today that they are not the same things. They're two different, total different opposite things. So what is religion? I'm going to start from there. If you check on Philippians 1 verse 21 in your Bible, it will give you more clue. Religion is earning your way. You earn your way with religion. It is you extending your hand to God like this. You extend your hand, you reach out to God. You say, God, take my hands. I am falling. Help to lift me up. Take me. That is religion. In religion, you earn the right to be reconciled through your works. What does that mean? It means you have to work hard in order for you to be qualified for salvation. You work so hard. You have to work so hard for God to pick you up, to take your hands. And whatever thing you do is categorized 
to list good and bad. There are things you should do and there are things you shouldn't do. That is religion. It gives you a set of rules and regulations and obligations, things you should do to be a good person and things you shouldn't do in order not to be a bad person. Do you understand that? It is by your works that it's your works that will qualify you to be a good person. Religion, it is a system of beliefs. It's like a code of moral, uh, uh, moral lessons. These codes, they judge you in order for you to be qualified or disqualified. And for you to be qualified, it means you have, you have at care or you have obeyed certain rules. And in order for you to be disqualified, it means you haven't adhered to the rules and regulations. That is religion. Religion is usually enforced by those who are in power, those who are occupying power positions. They are the ones who usually work with rules and regulations. And their intentions is to make, to put their authority over you, to control you. Their intention to control you, it's not from God. God doesn't want you to be controlled. God doesn't want to put you under any rules and regulations for you to be qualified to be his own child. For example, let's say I am a religious person, for example, and I decide that a woman going to church without covering her hair leads to promiscuity, leads to fornication, it's not good, it's bad. That's what I think as a religious person. And now, I decide to tell my followers or my Christians that the attitude of a woman coming to church without covering her hair leads to fornication. It's bad. It's, it's sinful. And it's evil. And I forbid my congregation, my followers, from doing that, from coming to church without covering their hair. I convince them. I try to look for good reasons from the Bible to make things up so that they believe in what I'm telling them. But it's my opinion, basically, because the Bible doesn't uh, uh, hold any passage like that. And now my congregation starts coming to church each one time covering their hair. And years later, it becomes a tradition in my church. It becomes a tradition with my followers. They said, no, uh, it's bad for a woman to come to church without covering their hair. And as generation goes by, that's how this rule will become really solid. Nobody would even care at a certain point who even came up with such a policy, who made such a rule. People would just follow it because from generation to generation, that's how it has been. It's been practiced in that church, in that congregation, and one con generation leads to the next generation. They train them on the same thing and it goes and goes. And at a point in time, it becomes a norm. Oh no, 
this is how it's supposed to be. So what I've just explained to you now is just an example of religious ways of doing things. I get up one day, I set up my rules on what I believe. Although the Bible doesn't endorse what I'm teaching, I make it to look as if, yeah, it is from the Bible and this is how it's supposed to be. And everyone falls on it and say, yeah, it's true. Woman is, woman is not supposed to come to church without covering the hair. Or, for example, dancing in church is bad because it leads to fornication and promiscuous habit. It's perverting and, and, and it's terrible. It's sinful. Those kind of stuff. So I now use my trust, the trust that my followers have on me and my authority. I now use it to force this belief on them. You understand what I'm saying? But it's a belief that I've created out of my own version. It's not endorsed in the Bible. I hope you get this right. I even go as far as adding rules that are not biblical at all. Maybe I might have a good motive for doing this, but I am preaching religion. I am preaching religion. And religion is not Christianity. The set of rules that are put in place for people to follow. Don't do this. Don't do that. Do this. Don't do that. If you do this, you are sinning and you have to do this in order not to sin. Those rules and regulations. That's what I'm talking about. I might use Jesus to justify them. Adding so many requirements to being a Christian. You don't need all these requirements for you to be qualified as a Christian. You don't need them. Christianity. Now we talk about Christianity. We've talked about religion as being a set of rules and regulation binding you, qualifying you whether you are good or bad. And we've also said religion is about you extending your hands to God to say, God, here I am, take me. Religion, Christianity now. Christianity, on the other hand, is God extending his hands to you and say, my daughter, my son, here am I. I can pick you up when you fall. Just take my hands. Can you see the difference? God extends his hands to you. That. Is Christianity. Christianity is by God's grace that we are qualified to be his children. You do not have to work very hard for you to be qualified as a child of God. You don't have to work. The Bible says it's not by might, it's not by power. It's just by the grace of God. It's by the spirit of God. That is Christianity. I hope you're getting clearly the difference here that I'm making. When Jesus was on earth, religion was very common. The Pharisees and the laws of Moses, all those were religious laws. These laws and they made these laws to rule people because you have to do certain things in order 
to be sure of salvation, to be sure that you're a good person and, 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 and you are with God. You have to do certain things. You have to obey the rules and the regulations. But with Christianity, there are no rules and regulations that you have to obey. You're not bound to any rules and regulations to follow. And if you look at it, Jesus himself was against religion. He was against it in a very, very, very harsh way. Because the Pharisees, they have their laws that you have to keep the Sabbath holy. Yes, you have to keep the Sabbath holy. The Bible says so. Just as I explained earlier, they took this point and they molded it up nicely. And they added a lot of other things that the Bible doesn't endorse. The Bible says you keep the Sabbath holy. Yes, the Bible says so. But the Pharisees said, you don't have to even spit on the floor on Sabbath. Because if you spit on the floor, your spit mixed with mud will make a mold. And if it makes a mold, it means you are working. You have work on Sabbath and you get punished for that. So you see what I'm saying, how religious people, they take the Bible and they interpret it and add things and subtract other things and they make rules and regulations. And you can notice that Jesus was really angry about these laws, these rules that the Pharisees were placing on people, thereby abusing people's trust for God. In one instant, we see how Jesus healed a blind man on Sabbath. How did Jesus heal this blind man on Sabbath? He spit on the floor, he spit on the ground, and the spit made a mold, and he took the mold and rubbed it on the blind man's eyes. And the blind man could see. And uh, why did he do that? I mean, Jesus is God. He could have just spoken words and the blind man would have regained his sight. But why did he decide to spit on the floor and make a mold? It was a mockery on the Pharisees and their laws. It was a very big mockery. If you look at it, he was like, okay, nonsense with this, your laws and rules and regulation. It has nothing to do with Christianity. That's why he spat on the floor, on the ground, and made him mold something that the Pharisees prohibit. And that is what he did to heal the blind man's eyes and the man regained his sight. And if you look further, the woman who was bent for years, Jesus also healed her on the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees were very angry. They're like, you're not supposed to work on this day. And Jesus said, you hypocrites. A woman who has been bent, the devil has made him, her to bend in this position for years. And I'm here to heal her. And you, you're telling me about laws and regulations that I do not have to heal anyone on Sabbath, healing this woman. I mean, it's interesting if you look at all this. So religion is not Christianity. When you practice religion, your relationship with God gets reduced to sets of rules and regulations to follow. Do this. Don't do that. If you do this, you will be right with God. If you do not do this, 
you'll be wrong with God. This is totally missing the point. Missing the point, the reason why Jesus came. God wants so much more. He wants to have a real relationship with you. Not based on rules and regulations and laws to follow. No. He wants to show his love to you. That's what matters to God. The Sabbath day, you cannot have a real relationship with God without spending time with him. That's the reason why the Sabbath day was created and that you should keep it holy. It was a day that you have to make time to spend with your God, make time to spend with your family, make time to show love to God and to fellow human beings. The Ten Commandments, it's all about relationship. It's all about improving your relationship with God and improving your relationship with other people. Hallelujah, wonderful. Matthew 22 verse 57 to 40. The whole law can be summed up in one word, which is love. God is love. Christianity is love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is well. So, the Pharisees took the commandments of the, of the Sabbath and to keep it holy. And they added a lot of religious issues into that commandment, making it so ridiculous, such as spitting on the ground, Sabbath. It's interesting, when I went through this, I was like, what were they thinking? Spitting on the ground? I mean, if you have saliva in your mouth, where do you now <laughs> throw it? And you can see how interesting, how ridiculous religion is. So Jesus showed this regard for their laws by repeatedly healing people on that same Sabbath day. And you can see the Bible recounts how the Pharisees were so angry with Jesus each time he had to heal someone on the Sabbath day. Hallelujah. It is well. Hallelujah. He did not have to spit on the ground, as I repeat it. He only did that to mock at the Pharisees. This uh, story I just recounts on uh, it's about Jesus healing the blind man. You could check it on John 9, verse 6 to 7, 13 to 14, and 16. You'll see how Jesus healed the blind man. Hallelujah. So religion, let me reiterate, religion is man trying to reach up to God, trying to reach up to God. God, take me, take me. That is religion. Religion is man has to be at the right path with God. You must earn your salvation by doing good things, good deeds, or certain acts and not doing certain acts. Certain acts are evil, so you mustn't do them. Certain acts have been qualified good, so you mustn't do them. That is religion. It puts you on the rules and regulations to follow. 
Christianity, on the other hand, is about God reaching out to you. God reaches out to you and says, my son, my daughter, here am I. Take my hands. I can lift you up when you fall. That is Christianity. Can you get the differences? What it is, Christianity is about what God has already accomplished for you. What God has already done for you. The opportunity to be with God. That is Christianity. All you need to do is to believe that Christ has already paid the price for you. He has paid the price for the evil that you ever did. He has paid it all for you. We are filled with sin. And there is nothing we can do to earn righteousness or to be saved. God, in the form of Jesus Christ, stepped in our place, in our position, and paid the price. The price that we were supposed to pay for our sin. Jesus has paid it for you. Can you see how big this is? Ah, oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. I don't know if you understand clearly. The price that you were supposed to pay for your sin, Jesus came and paid it for you. He gave you a free gift of salvation. It's for you. It's left for you to choose whether to believe in Jesus Christ. That's just it. John chapter 1 verse 12. And if you can check also the book of Romans chapter 3 verse 19 to 25. The Bible says we are free by God's great gift. You just have to claim it. You just have to claim that gift parcel. It's like a birthday gift. It is a free gift. But that gift is free to you, but it has cost the giver a lot to prepare that package for you. The gift costs so dearly, but it is a free gift to you. But this gift, doesn't belong to you until you believe that the giver cares so much about you. And who is the giver? It's Jesus Christ. And that what is inside this package is something very, very precious, very precious and very good for you. The gift is not yours until you trust the giver who is Jesus and choose to receive the gift. You have to trust Jesus and decide to receive the gift. That's how it works. So you cannot be saved by abiding to laws, rules, and regulations. No, that is not it. Rules and regulations will not save you. You are saved by His grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 9 states that God saved you by his grace. Then, if God saved you by his grace, oh glory, hallelujah, 
what do you have to do in return? We will talk about that later. And you cannot take credit. You cannot take credit for this because God did it for you. Salvation is not a reward for your good works, for the good things that you do. Did you hear that? Salvation? You don't get it because you're, you've been good, because you've been doing good things. You get it because God is so kind and he gracefully gives it to you. So you cannot boast about it. You may say you will go to heaven because you've been such a good person, you've been doing good things. Being good has nothing to do with whether you are saved or not. Because the rules and regulations to say you are saved or not is religion. It is religion. You have to get this point very straight. You cannot earn it. Thank God. Because none of us could ever be good enough. None of us. The Bible says, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. God is perfect. And in order to be one with him, we ought to be perfect. But we cannot be perfect. Only one person, and that is Jesus Christ. We can only be perfect through Jesus Christ. Do you get that? It's through Jesus Christ. We can perfect our ways. Jesus stands in the gap. And he has paid the price for you. Your sins are erased because of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God in the highest blessings. Glory, glory. Wow. The book of First John chapter 1 verse 8 to 10 says, If we claim we have no sin. We are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from our wicked ways. Hallelujah. Oh, isn't that lovely? God is good. So, the question is, why did Moses and the Pharisees came with all these rules and regulations? Why? The rules and regulations were given to show you that you need God in order for you to be saved. You need God. That's what the rules and regulations were. At that time, the ancient time, the days of Moses and the Pharisees, Romans 7 verse 7 says, In fact, it was the laws that saved me my sin. I would never have known that. Coveting is wrong. If the law had not said it. If the law had not said, you must not covet, I wouldn't have known that coveting is wrong. That's what Romans 7 verse 7 says. So you see, there's well the importance of the laws in those days. The law was to correct. It was not bad at all. Until people started 
misinterpreting it ignorantly. Out of selfish reasons or out of authority to put their authority and control others. Until when people started doing that, the law wasn't a bad thing. It was there to correct people. The law enables you to know that you need a redeemer and you need a savior to save you from your sins. Hallelujah, glory to God in the highest. Blessings, blessings. Who is there? Can you just indicate at the left corner of the screen? Let me know that you are there in the name of Jesus. I'm going to sing the life changes song. Hallelujah. I'm sure you all are familiar with this song. Glory to God in the highest. Hallelujah. Are you ready? Are you ready for the life changes song? Wow. Now, we are life changers. We are workers in God's fine yard. We are His chosen people. We reach out with His love. We are life changers, spreading love through the world. We are life changers, spreading love throughout the world. You are my brother, you are my sister. We are one blessed family. You are my brother. You are my sister. We are one blessed family. We Life changers, spreading love throughout the world. We are life changers, spreading love throughout the world. We are life changers. If you're just joining this is life changes show it's a place where you find meaning and purpose for your life and tonight we're talking about the difference between Christianity and religion it's been issues people have been having about these two words and they haven't been able to demarcate the differences. People use these words interchangeably and it has caused a lot of confusion in Christian's life. It has caused a lot of difficulties because they've got it erroneously and it has led them to have wrong beliefs, wrong confessions, they make wrong confessions, they have wrong beliefs, wrong mentality about Christianity. So I'm here to clarify this point, hallelujah. 
We've gone so far, we've talked about the differences between Christianity and religion, and I'm continuing. You do not have the ability to live, to love God. You do not have it, let alone to love your fellow human being every day. You do not have the ability to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You do not have it. And you do not have the ability to love your neighbor as yourself every day. Wow. This is because you're a human being. Because sin was introduced to you by Adam and Eve. And you are inclined to sin in one way or the other. You are inclined to sin. You are a redemption from this predicament through Christ. Jesus Christ has paid the price for you. He has set you free. Glory. Wow. You are now free. He only came to fulfill the law. The same law that I explained to you, a set of rules and regulations. Jesus came to fulfill these laws. He didn't come to abolish or eradicate the laws. Matthew 5 verse 17 to 18 states, Don't, Do not misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the laws of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappears, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. Blessings, did you hear that? So through Christ, you are made perfect. Perfect in God's eyes. Christ has made you perfect in God's eyes. He has forgiven all of your sin. This, your sin of the past, and your sin of the future has been eradicated. Did you hear that? Your sin of the past, your sin of the future, of the, of the future, all has been eradicated. Hallelujah, glory to God in the highest. So, you are now free. You are completely free. On receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, he gave you his Holy Spirit, if only you have received the Holy Spirit. Have you received the Holy Spirit? If you haven't received the Holy Spirit, then uh, you'll have to receive the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So, giving you His Holy Spirit, thereby giving you the power to change you and to make you be like him, to make you be like he himself, Jesus. The Bible says, as God is, so are you here on earth. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. This is a process, but as this happens, you begin to realize that you are living in the love originally required by the law, the original intention, the heart of the law becomes established in your life. Hallelujah. Your relationship with God and others is founded in love. It's founded in love. The Holy Spirit accomplishes it within you. You have the Holy Spirit. It accomplishes God's love in your heart, in your life. 
it is not an end it's to accomplish or done by your power you don't have to work for you to accomplish God's love in your life it's only through the Holy Spirit you have to receive the Holy Spirit hallelujah anyone here who want to receive the Holy Spirit at this point just indicates to me receiving the Holy Spirit is receiving the active power of God in your life if you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and you've received the Holy Spirit then you know you are sorted because you've received Christ and you have the active power of God in your life so the first thing is to receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and the second is to receive the Holy Spirit as the receiving the active power of God so let us start off by receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior if anyone there to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior I'll lead you to receiving Christ this distance is not a barrier with God and uh, yeah I'll just uh, lead you to receiving Jesus Christ uh, sister, brother, you repeat after me wholeheartedly, not not partial, not not with the lips, but from the heart. You have to mean what you're saying, because things of the Lord, you have to mean them. There is no joke about it. Get serious. I lead you to receiving Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You've got nothing absolutely to lose. If there's anything, it's gains and wins you'll be making. And this is the most important decision in your life. And do not miss out on this. Because you cannot say you are a Christian if you have not received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe you are that person in Christ has been standing at the door of your heart, knocking and say, let me in, let me in. And you're busy doing your own stuff. And I'm inviting you now to receive Christ, open the door of your heart so that Christ can come and reside in your heart and be the landlord. Hallelujah. Okay, repeat after me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That you, Jesus Christ, you died and God raised you from the dead. And I believe that you are alive today. I confess with my mouth that you, Jesus Christ, you are the Son of God. Oh, thank you, Father for being my savior i take you as my personal lord and savior from this day on thank you for eternal life thank you lord in the name of jesus christ amen congratulations you have done the right thing you've taken the best decision and you've done it jesus is in your life as you've just received him congratulations once more and you've cast a celebration in heaven because the heavenly host they do rejoice on each soul that joins the family of god heavens rejoice see what you've just done you've cast a celebration in heaven this is huge blessings hallelujah congratulations sister Congratulations, brother. Hallelujah. I'm so proud of you. Um, I encourage you to start off by reading your Bible on a daily basis. Read your Bible and pray regularly. Speak with him. Make him your friend, your closest friend, your companion. You speak with him. Every problem, everything you have, discuss it with him and you'll see results. Hallelujah. We are going to do the, uh, we're going to worship God.
Hallelujah. Just hang on there. Hang on there. We come in. Hallelujah. This is Life Changes show. And uh, we're going to worship God with the Life Changes song. Song number three in the Life Changes first gospel music album. It is titled, I Will Wait On You. Hallelujah. Let's worship God with this song. It's coming. Just be in a worship mood. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. This is Life Changes show. Glory to God in the highest. Come on, come on. Glory, glory, glory. Sati Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Just hang on. I'm waiting for the song to play. We're experiencing some technical problems, but it is well. Come on. Hallelujah. Wow, well, it's taking forever. Oh, but this is not happening. Wow, come on, come on, come on. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
life changes show if you're just joining us you can just leave a comment on the left hand side of your screen at the comment box just to let me know where you're connecting from so i can give you a very warm welcome if you're watching me right now know that you are a life changer you're not here by accident because god wants you to be here it is a Saturday night. You could have been many other places, but God chose you to be here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Wonderful. So, Jesus came to make you have salvation. He only came to fulfill the law. He didn't come to eradicate the laws. So far, I hope you've understood the difference between Christianity and religion. Hallelujah. Now, I received this question and I want to share it with you very quickly. It's very important. I've been laughing like the whole time, like glory to God in the highest. And uh, the question is, um, somebody told me, look, life changes. Um, I've been a Christian for more than 20 years of my life. And I've been serving God diligently. I've been attending church services. I've been very active in every Christian movement, meetings, and I've been paying my tithes regularly. I've been making donations, supporting people. I've done a lot of things. And I've, at this point, as I tell you, I've given up on all those things because my problems didn't go away. For 20 years, I've been a Christian and I've been doing serving God diligently. And my problems kept multiplying. And uh, I decided to quit because I don't understand. I've prayed, I've fasted. I do everything I could do thinking that God will meet me halfway and pick me up and solve my problems. And I keep hearing that he is a very loving God, but I don't see the love that is towards me. So maybe I'm just dry off. I don't have anything good in me. Maybe I've done a lot of sin and God has abandoned me because I and my whole family, we are living in abject poverty and deprivation. Things are not working at all. And when I decided to quit after having done everything I could do and God was like he, he he didn't care he didn't even look at me I decided to quit Christianity quit the church and I started working on my own effort to make things happen and that was when things started really happening in my life things started changing so at this point nobody can tell me that God is good and that I I am saved by his grace. I don't have to work or do anything for me to have a relationship with God or to have him meet me at the point of my needs because it's by my personal effort. I have worked so hard and things are coming right with me and for me. So I do not understand what God 
that your God is the God you're talking about. Because ever since I quit, I've been doing well and things have been going well with me. Well, hallelujah. <laughs> Did you hear that? This person is not the only person in such a situation. You might be out there, you're having problems, maybe the death of someone, maybe you're looking to get married, maybe you're looking to have children, maybe you're looking for a job, maybe you need money, financial difficulties, maybe you need food, you're looking for clothing, maybe you want to travel, you want to spend holidays somewhere, you want to relocate, and you don't even have the means for anything and Things are just so tight and tough. Wow, I've got good news for you. Hallelujah. What could be the reason? And if you look at it, this, most people who are having this struggling life and difficulties are Christians. They call themselves Christians. These are people who think they believe in Jesus Christ. And that's you see, just as this person says, I've been going to church my whole life. I've been doing this. I've been doing that. So she is not alone. There are lots of other people out there. And the thing is, why is it always those who have been in church, who know God, who claim they are Christians, who always suffer? What, is, what, what could be the reason behind this? If you followed me up to this stage, you would understand clearly. Some religious person must have built the foundation for your life. And they have painted a wrong picture about God, about Jesus and the person he is. And they have painted a wrong picture about who you are. Christianity is not about imitating Christ. Christianity is not about going to church each Sunday. Christianity is not about doing good. Going to church is not a bad thing. But if it becomes a ritual, if it becomes something, a set of rules that has to be there like this, straightforward, yeah, you know, on your head, that's where you're missing the point. If you have been taught wrong doctrines about Jesus Christ and Christianity, you will have wrong thoughts about Jesus Christ and Christianity, you would have wrong beliefs about Jesus Christ and Christianity, you would be making wrong confessions about Jesus Christ and Christianity. And that will lead you to walking wrongly and by walking wrongly, you would have wrong behaviors, wrong attitude toward Jesus Christ and Christianity. And finally, you will be living a life of never getting what God had already prepared for you. Can, can, can you follow? It starts from the beginning. It's just like you start training your child wrongly. You do not expect to have an upright child at maturity because you didn't train the child correctly. It's just like a dog. If you train your dog to hear you and to lay down when you tell them and to get up when you tell them that's what will be but if you didn't train them they wouldn't get to understand these things so who 
has been indoctrinating you from the beginning about your Christian life and about God. Who? Is it a religious person or a true Christian? That's the question. Because you have been living under religion, but you think you are living the Christian life. You've been living under religion. A religious person must have misled you about God. The Bible says in, in John chapter 14 verse 9, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. What does that tell you? Jesus is God. And the Bible goes further. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. It says, Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. Wow. And as God is, so are we here on earth. That's what the Bible says. In, in John 1 verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word became flesh. And dwell amongst us. Hallelujah. This is in John 1 verse 14. Glory to God. Glory. When you want to know God, look at Jesus Christ. He came to clarify you about who God is. About the nature of God. Hallelujah. Who God is and to be initiator of the relationship with God. Thank you, Father. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? So, God is not looking at you. God works. You will never be completely good. God is the one who does the work. He is not looking at the good works that you do to qualify you to be his child. He is not looking at that. Because you will never be completely good. Only Jesus is complete. Hallelujah. The relationship with God that you have because Jesus brought the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus came and reconciled you with God. You are the person who commits the crime. You are the offender. Jesus took your place and paid the price for you. Hallelujah. 1 John 2 verse 1 and Romans 8 verse 34. Because Jesus loves us, that's why he came and paid the price for us. Religion must have made you to feel that God needs you to work hard in order for him to love you. That's not true. It's not true. Matthew 11 verse 29 to 30 states, Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. 
and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy to bear and my burden is light. Hallelujah. God could not say this if he needs you to be perfect. God could not say this if he needs you to work so hard to be qualified. I, I am here to testify that when you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and you go further to receive the Holy Spirit, which is the active power of God in your life, you are settled. You are settled for good. You arrive at your resting place in God's arms. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You do not need to work hard to qualify for this position. You became a saint, not a sinner. Something you don't work for. See how good God is? Hallelujah. You may still choose to sin. And the sin will definitely affect your relationship with God in one way or the other. But it will not change the fact that you are his child. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So, Christianity is not about imitating Christ. It is neither about going to church every Sunday. You do not become a Christian by acting like a Christian. No. You do not become a Christian by going to church regularly. There are no standard rules as far as Christianity is concerned. Or what God requires from you is love. Did you hear that? Or what God requires from you is love. To love him and to love your fellow human beings. That's all. Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest. Oh, hallelujah. Who is there? Who is there? Tell me. Thank you, Father, for this moment. I'm going to ask you there's anyone there to receive the Holy Spirit but uh, you have to indicate at the left hand corner of the screen with the comment box then I'll lead you to receiving the Holy Spirit because there I received the Holy Spirit my life changed for good and I know that your life has changed can you just place your hand on your forehead like this and I'm going to lead you to receiving the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Sister, brother, wherever you are, distance is not a barrier with God. Anything that concerns God is spiritual. So I'm leading you to receive the Holy Spirit. Sister, brother, receive the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, it is done. Hallelujah. It is well with you, my sister, my brother. You've done the right thing. You just have to keep on reading your Bible and meditating. Worship the Lord. Sing. Sing to the Lord. The Lord wants to hear your voice. He has put in his song in your mouth, a song of praise, a new song. 
make up anything and just have it to him and say, Father, this is for you. Hail me, more than happy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for this session. I pray that everyone who is connected, they want to go as they came because you are a God of abundance and plenty and you have met all of them at the point of their needs in the name of Jesus. I break the chain, the yoke of poverty, lack. I break the chain of yoke, deprivation in the mighty name of Jesus. It is well with you and your family in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I'm going to sing to you because this is Life Changes Gospel Music Ministry. And what do we do here? We minister the word of God through songs. So I cannot end this session without singing. You are joy that fills my soul. You are the world that changes lives. All I have is you. You are joy that fills my soul. Word that changes lives. All I have is you. All I have is you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh. You are joy that fills my soul. You are the world that changes lives. All I have is you. You are the joy that fills my soul. You are the world that changes lives. All I have is you. All I have is you, Jesus. All I have is you. All I have is you, Jesus. All I have is you. All I have is you, Father. All I have is you, Jesus. All I have is you. All I have is you. Jesus, all I have is you, Jesus. You are joy that fills my soul, hallelujah. You are a world that changes lives. All I have is you. You've done great things in my life and greater things yet to come. All I have is you. All I have is you, Jesus. All I have is you. All I have is you. Jesus, all I have is you, all I have is you, Father, all I have is you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. It's good to have you all here connected and I bless the name of the Lord for your life. I bless your going in and your coming out. I bless your family and everything that concerns you. Oh, you come with a testimony because he is putting a new song in your mouth. Praise him.
brother, praise him. Praise God. Make friends with God. Sing praises to him and make him your closest connection. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, you are blessed. Oh, glory. This